So I hope everybody in the room knows how much of an honor it is to be up here. Uh, to work in the Department of Laboratory Medicine, is an, um, it's, it's absolutely incredible and to work with all of you. So thank you. Um, it is an honor. And today I'm going to talk about protein quantification by mass spectrometry. Now you might be sitting out there saying, why in the world would I want to do that? <laughs> it's a good question. So I'm going to spend a fair amount of the talk trying to make you uh, see that it is a reasonable thing to do and, and why we want to do it. But before I get started, I have been doing something else <laughs> over the last year. Uh, this is Margaret Ann. She's our, our, uh, our child. She's eight and a half months old. And, and you can see her standing here, but she actually spends most of her time holding her feet, which I think is great. <laughs> I'm convinced that she can already solve differential equations in her head and just can't tell me that she can, but, but that's my hope. Uh, and, and I think if you look carefully, I don't know how well she's showing up, but there's a very strong resemblance to me. Does everybody... <laughs> in, in, case, in case you don't believe me, this is what she looked like when she was born. <laughs> Uh, but seriously, <laughs> she, so I hope that doesn't make it on television because she will never forgive me, obviously. <laughs> uh, I should say, since this is a, a Grand Rounds and it's for CME, that uh, we do, I, I am listed as an inventor on a U.S. patent application that the University of Washington um, applied to uh, the U.S. Patent and Trade Office for the thyroglobulin assay that I'll talk about in the second half of my talk. The objectives, I really want to point out and, and provide the motivation for doing mass spectrometry on proteins in serum by pointing out the limitations of, of immunoassays. And I'm going to spend a fair amount of time talking about thyroglobulin as an example, but I'll remind you over and over again that thyroglobin is just an example. Immunoassays have problems. I'm going to talk about the benefits of using mass spectrometry, the potential benefits, and then talk about some of the hurdles intermixed as we go through all of this. So the thyroid glances at the base of the neck, a good physical exam, the a clinician will wrap their hands around your neck and squeeze and ask you to swallow. And you might feel like you're getting strangled to death, but really they're just feeling for lumps, bumps, and any misshapenness to the thyroid gland. I'm not going to talk about any thyroid disease except for cancer um, and, uh, and thyroglobulin as a, as a tumor marker for thyroid cancer. But thyroglobulin is biologically the precursor for thyroid hormone. And histologically, when you look at the thyroid gland, you see these pink circles, which are actually in three dimensions, spher spherical or, or globular structures, packed with protein, it's called colloid. And that colloid is almost entirely made up of thyroglobulin. And surrounding this colloid, which is also called the follicle, is the follicular cell. And the follicular cell, which we've blown up over here, um, is responsible for making the thyroglobulin, spinning it into the colloid. And then when thyroid uh, stimulating hormone, or TSH, impinges on the TSH receptor, the thyroglobulin is brought back into the cell. And the thyroid hormones, T3 and T4, which are assembled out of tyrosine residues on the surface of the thyroglobulin, are picked off. And they're sent across the basolateral membrane into the circulation. So the thyroglobulin is supposed to be out here in the colloid, not supposed to be in the circulation. Again, histologically, normal thyroid looks like this. But about four out of 100 people will have a thyroid nodule, and about one in 1,000 people in Seattle have thyroid cancer. And uh, there are different types of thyroid cancer. I'm not going to go into any great detail. And so I'm not going to talk about medullary cancer, which is a cancer of the C cells, which make calcitonin. But we do look at both anaplastic and differentiated thyroid carcinoma. I'm sorry, the mouse is a little bit tricky. But you can look at normal versus uh, papillary differentiated thyroid carcinoma, for instance, and see it's trying to do something useful, maybe make something constructive, whereas anaplastic is completely just a big mess of goo with little blue dots in the middle. What's really amazing is that this guy trying to make something useful, in fact, more than 90% 90, 90 of differentiated thyroid carcinomas make thyroglobulin. So even though architecturally they're useless, they are still a thyroid cell or a follicular type cell. An anaplastic carcinoma, which you wouldn't expect to be able to do anything productive whatsoever just by looking at it, up to about 50% of them make thyroglobulin, which is very useful for us in the, in the clinical laboratory because we can use thyroglobulin as a tumor marker. But we don't use it to screen people for thyroid cancer. We only use it after treatment. And by treatment, I mean after surgery, surgical or radioablation, removing the thyroid tissue from the, organ, from the human being altogether. <coughs> 
And then we can monitor serum thyroglobulin <laughs> to look for recurrence of disease, or in the case of immediately after treatment, looking for residual treatment or tumor at the, at the uh, surgical bed or potentially even metastatic disease. Now, the thyroglobin is supposed to stay in the colloid, but somehow it makes it into circulation. And this is kind of magic, because no one really understands why. But thyroglobulin does somehow leak into the lymphatics um, from any tissue that makes it. Therefore, for differentiated thyrocarcinoma and many anaplastic tumors, we can actually use serum thyroglobulin to monitor after treatment. Now, this is grand rounds, and I could present a patient, um, but I thought it would be kind of fun to present the immunoassay as a patient. And so let me just run through the history and physical of a 48-year-old uh, immunoassay <laughs> <coughs> who walked into my office and was complaining of not really being sure of the answer sometimes. <laughs> now, it's true. The thyroglobulin, the first thyroglobulin immunoassay was published in The Lancet in 1961, so it has been around for a very, very long time, 48 years. History of present illness, uh, it was a previously healthy assay. It's still able, able to perform its daily routines. That's a terrible pun, my apology. Uh, <laughs> uncertainty is, uh, the uncertainty in, in, uh, in this immunoassay is much worse when interacting with certain patients' serum, but it always feels better when it takes the weekend off. <laughs> Past medical history, it's had 40 years of untreated issues, and uh, it was transferred to automated instrumentation in 1999. On physical exam, we have a well-developed automated immunoassay and no acute distress, but it does appear fatigued and easily confused. The diagnosis, sorry, it's at the very bottom of the slide. I would say it's a typical immunoassay. And the treatment, we can't prescribe euthanasia for immunoassays. Just kidding. Here's a picture of the immunoassay. <clears throat> and I'm presenting this picture just as a representative immunoassay. This happens to be the Beckman Access immunoassay that we use in our clinical laboratory, um, just as an example of a sandwich immunoassay so I can talk about the interferences um, in subsequent slides. So this blue circle is a paramagnetic bead that's coated in streptavidin. And we can grab onto uh, the capture antibody, which is labeled with biotin. And we can make a sandwich with thyroglobulin and a reporter antibody, which has alkaline phosphatase. And alkaline phosphatase can be used to generate light in a chemiluminescent reaction. We do this in a homogeneous fashion, which means we add the antibodies together. We allow the antibodies to interact with the thyroglobulin. And then we use the paramagnetic beads to pull out the sandwiches. So we capture the biotin-labeled antibody in any labeled reporter antibody that comes along with it, we presume has been made via sandwich with thyroglobulin. But this is just the model of immunoassay imperfection. There are a number of problems with which Mark Wenner and I recently published in a review in the Journal of Immunological Methods. In fact, the title of the uh, paper is The Fundamental <coughs> Flaws of Immunoassays, and it's published in the Journal of Immunological Methods, which we th are quite proud of. <laughs> The, uh, but let me talk about these four ways that, tumor mar that, that immunoassays, and I'm going I'm to focus on tumor marker immunoassays, really suffer. The first is poor interplatform concordance. The idea that if we measure the, uh, the assay on one uh, system and then go across town and measure it on another system, we'll get two different answers for the same specimen. Something called the hook effect. Uh, heterophilic, which I like to use the term anti-reagent antibodies, and if I could do away with the term heterophilic antibodies, I would. And, the, and we'll talk about autoantibodies as well, which is a really common problem. So first, poor interplatform concordance. Why can't everybody just agree is really the question, right? Well, there's a good reason. It's called intellectual property. And when we're going to make an immunoassay, we have to start with some epitope. And we can use pretty much anything. We can use the whole protein, the whole antigen. We can use a domain of the protein, or we can even use peptides. All are good immunogens for making antibodies. And because of intellectual property concerns, different assays, different manufacturers use different epitopes. Importantly, in different people, the tumor antigen may be different from person to person. You could have polymorphisms. You could have differences in post-translational modifications. In fact, there are great examples of how thyroglobulin is different when it comes from a, a differentiated thyroid carcinoma versus normal thyroid tissue. So if you have different post-translational modifications, yet you raise your antibody to something, you may get variability from assay to assay. And that's the result, is that we get variable results across platforms. That's even with an international reference material. It used to be called CRM, and now it's called BCR-457. 
it turns out that every one of those assays that's available on the market is really good at measuring BCR-457. But it's not so good at measuring about 30% of patients, which will completely disagree from platform to platform. This isn't just thyroglobulin. There's a great paper from ARUP, the laboratory of Bill Roberts, who looked at TSH, or thyroid stimulating hormone, uh, which we use in the diagnosis of hypothyroidism. There are guidelines. There's a specific cutoff where if your TSH um, is, uh, uh, is uh, sorry, am I saying this right? If it's above the, the cutoff, then you're going to be diagnosed with hypothyroidism. And it's been um, debated, the, the guideline is greatly debated. However, if I were to have my TSH measured here at, the, at University Hospital, I might be diagnosed with hypothyroidism and placed on levothyroxine. But if I go across town and have it measured on another platform, I might be at the other side of that line, and I won't be treated. So, it's not just a problem with thyroglobulin. This is a problem with many immunoassays. The hook effect. We like to have our assays operating on the linear part of the curve, so that as we make more sandwiches, we get more signal from our assay. And that's true. Add a little bit of thyroglobulin, make another sandwich, add a little bit more. But there's a point at which you've made all the sandwiches that you can make. And as I continue to add thyroglobulin into the system, I can actually uh, saturate both the capture antibody and the reporter antibody, and I won't make any more sandwiches, and we can lose our signal. And so it's possible in a patient with lots and lots of thyroglobulin to get a perfectly negative assay. Some laboratories take great care, and our immunology laboratory is one of the pioneers in trying to come up with ways to <coughs> prevent the hook effect from effect affecting patient care. But not every laboratory is like that. There are lots of other assays in our laboratory where the hook effect can be a problem, and so we monitor a number of different assays for this problem. Heterophilic or anti-reagent antibodies in the sandwich assay bridge the gap. So anti-reagent antibodies, they are nonspecific antibodies that we have in our plasma that can bind different mammals, for instance. So it could bind the mouse uh, monoclonal antibodies involved in the assay. There's actually human beings that make anti-ruthenium antibodies, which I think is fascinating. Um, but anywhere between 3 and 10% of people who walk in the front door will have some sort of anti-reagent antibody that will interfere with an assay. And in the thyroglobulin assay, that number is about 3%. And if we use uh, blocking, um, antibody blocking reagents, we can actually lower that down to about 0.3%. But now you're still talking about three people in 1,000 who will have a false positive result from the thyroglobulin immunoassay. What does that mean? That means inappropriate treatment. Is it only a problem for thyroglobulin? Absolutely not. There's uh, at least one case report where a falsely positive prostate-specific uh, prostate antigen, or PSA, was elevated, and he was underwent uh, ionizing radiation and chemotherapy, and his PSA didn't go down because it was all due to an anti-reagent antibody. There are also examples of women who've had their uterus removed because of a falsely elevated um, human chorionic gonadotropin, or beta-HCG. So yes, this really does affect patient care, and in some cases is quite awful. The first assay where autoantibody interference was really understood and well-documented was the thyroglobulin assay. And 10% of the people in this room have antithyroglobulin autoantibodies. Don't worry, it's not terrible, but we have, many people have them. What's interesting is if, you're, if you have differentiated thyroid carcinoma, that number jumps to 25%. It's not exactly clear why. Um, immunologically, you could make up an argument that thyroglobulin is maybe a little bit different. We've already documented how the thyroglobulin is slightly different from the cancer. So maybe, or when it's, uh, liber when it's uh, secreted by the cancer. So maybe it's different to the immune system, therefore we make antibodies. Whatever the reason, 25 to 40 percent of the people that come into our laboratory to have thyroglobulin test tested for specifically this reason, monitoring differentiated thyroid carcinoma, we have autoantibodies. And in this situation, if we look at these uh, yellowish antibodies over here, if we coat our thyroglobulin, we can't make a sandwich. And so for a substantial number of patients who have autoantibodies, if we have a negative result, we have to say, eh, it might be negative or it might not. Now, these, this immunoassay has been spending 48 years of doing this, of saying, I'm not really sure. It's negative, but for 30% of the people, eh, it could be positive. Come back tomorrow. I'll tell you, maybe I'll have a different answer for it. <laughs> so unfortunately, we can have falsely negative results for a large number of the people that we're interested in measuring, this or measuring thyroglobulin for. So the goals. 
if we had the perfect thyroglobulin assay, it would be sensitive. And I put up this number because I'm going to talk about one nanogram per mil um, throughout my talk. This level of sensitivity has been documented, has already been shown to prevent untreated recurrence. If we have a sensitive assay, we can detect serum thyroglobulin before the disease gets so bad that we can't treat it. We'd like to have interlaboratory or interplatform standardization, where a measurement in one laboratory is the same as another. We'd like to get rid of the hook effect. And of course, we'd like to eliminate the heterophilic or anti reagent antibodies and autoantibody interference of the assay. So I would propose that we do this using mass spectrometry. Okay, so what, how would we do this? If we take plasma and proteolytic dige proteolytically digest it with trypsin into peptides, we can use the mass spectrometer uh, to look for specifically one peptide of interest. And so we'll load up all of those peptides onto the HPLC, and they'll elude off of the HPLC. We'll partially resolve the peptides from one another using the, the HPLC column. But even if peptides elude at exactly the same time, for instance, these four, we can use the mass spectrometer, in this case is a triple quadrupole mass spectrometer, to separate the peptides from one another. So in the first quadrupole, we're looking for the mass to charge ratio of the intact peptide. And then in the second quadrupole, which I'll call in a subsequent slide the collision cell, we can break that peptide into fragments. And then we can use the third quadrupole uh, to look for a specific fragment of that peptide. So the specificity is threefold. If it elutes off of the HPLC at the right time, if it has the, first, if it has the correct precursor mask in, in the first quadrupole, and if it has the right fragment mass in the third quadrupole, we can be relatively confident that that's the right peptide that we're looking for. So we might have a peptide that's too short, or sorry, too small. A mass to charge ratio is too low. We can have one that's too high. It won't even make it into the mass spectrometer. We'll never see it. We can have one that's just right, it will be broken up in the second quadrupole into pieces, but none of the fragments are the right size. Or we can have one that makes it all the way to detector. Anything that makes it through this system and makes it to the detector will give the mass spectrometer a signal. One of the hardest things that I've um, noticed at trying to um, get students in our program to understand um, how the mass spectrometer works is how can we measure many things at once? Because this is a fundamentally multiplexed instrument. We can, we can monitor, it turns out, hundreds of things all at the same time. So I'm just going to give a demonstration. I've made a little movie here to think about measuring just four things at once. And so what we have are four molecules that are eluding off the HPLC at the same time. We're using the first quadrupole to select for, in this case, blue, uh, the, the, the blue ion. And we're bashing it in what I've called here the second quadrupole before I was calling it the third. And then if the correct precursor and fragment makes it to the detector, we're going to get a signal. Now, the way that I do this all at once is I spend 50 milliseconds looking for orange, and then I spend 50 milliseconds looking for purple, uh, or in this case, blue, and I then switch and I focus on the next and the next. So in fact, I'm not measuring all of them, all of them at the same time. I'm actually spending a little dwell time to look for one, and then I look for the next, and then I look for the next. But 50 milliseconds is pretty fast, really. And so when you're watching the mass spectrometer, it actually looks like this. If I have four channels, and each of these is called a transition, where this is the first quadrupole, the mass to charge ratio of the first quadrupole, or the precursor mass, this is the mass to charge ratio that I'm looking for as a fragment. So this is the third quadrupole. And we call this whole thing a transition. So 636 to 1054 would be a transition, as would the other three. So this is four channels. Now, I'm only spending 50 milliseconds looking at each channel but it looks like I'm looking at all four at exactly the same time. And what I'm showing here is an internal standard peptide eluding at exactly the same time as the peptide that I'm interested in. We use internal standards in mass spectrometry a lot. We do that to control for some of the variability that we see from sample to sample in terms of ionization efficiency of our analytes. But also, uh, over the course of the day, the mass spectrometer behaves differently in the morning than it does in the afternoon. And so this helps control for all of that. So we're able to look not only at peptides that are eluding at exactly the same time, but have slightly different mass, which we use as internal standards. And then 20 seconds later, we can be looking for something else entirely, but all at the same time. So I'm going to talk a lot about response. And response is defined as the peak area of the peptide that we're interested in, which I'm just calling here peptide 1, divided by the peak area of the internal standard, which is, in this case, labeled with deuterium. And so the deuterium won't affect how it elutes off of the HPLC column, 
but it will look completely different in the mass spectrometer because we can tell the difference in the, the first and the third quadrupoles. If we have a, cali a set of calibrators and gather the response from each of the calibrators, we can turn that into a concentration, and that's the basis for our protein assays. It's the ba basis for our small molecules assays as well. Could this really work? Hmm. There's not a lot of thyroglobulin in plasma. This is just a picture from Lee Anderson, who heads up the Plasma Proteome Institute. He actually spoke here a couple of years ago. He reminds us that 22 proteins make up 99% of plasma. For every one peptide that I'm going to make when I digest serum from thyroglobulin, so every one peptide from thyroglobulin, there are 40 million peptides from albumin. So we have to find the needle in a needle stack. It's not hay, it's needles. So as the simplest of all experiments, we would just take plasma, we'd digest it into peptides, and we would look at it by mass spectrometry. And using this approach, um, well, first, could this possibly work? We're talking about thyroglobin, which is extremely low abundance. What about proteins that are high abundance? Is this even a, a, a potential solution for high abundance proteins? And so Luke Marnie, who was a graduate student here in the Department of Lab Medicine before he moved on to be a graduate student in the Department of Chemistry, started. And Sean Auger, who's a postdoctoral fellow in clinical chemistry in our department now, has just tried to quantify the apolipoproteins in serum. And these are the two apolipoproteins that we use in the immunology lab to currently predict cardiovascular disease risk over and above using HDL and LDL cholesterol. And what, again, I'm showing over on the uh, y-axis right now is just the response versus the nephilometric um, value that we got from the immunology laboratory. This is a pretty remarkable correlation. It's much better than I thought we were going to be able to do. And then with apolipoprotein B, we can see that. Now, I, don't, I haven't really explained the motivation still. Why would we do this by mass spectrometry? The simple answer here is we just measured two things at once. So the immunoassay, we had to do two different assays. Here I've measured two things. And if I can measure many proteins at once, mass spec becomes uh, infinitely less expensive than immunoassay. So I'm using the immunoassay to say, hey, look how good we're doing, but then I'm mocking immunoassay at exactly the same time. So I'm a little bit uh, heretical here and uh, schizophrenic. Now, uh, here, the response is on the y-axis. We'd like to convert this into an actual concentration, and so Sean's been working very hard at trying to find just the right uh, calibrators, and so what he's, he's, he's on his way. So he's found some serum-based calibrators, actually, that we stole from the immunology laboratory who runs the immunoassay. Sorry about that. And uh, <laughs> it, actually, it actually looks pretty reasonable. So what he's trying to do now in the, the experiments that he's continuing to do is to try to see if he can truly provide an absolute quantification of proteins by mass spectrometry in a multiplexed fashion, which has never been reported before. So those are abundant. Apolipoprotein A1 is around 35 micromolar. Apolipoprotein B is around 1 micromolar. We're talking about picomolar. So that's a million times less concentrated than these proteins to try to measure thyroglobulin. What about other proteins? So zinc alpha-2 glycoprotein is also <coughs> called ZAG. Um, they, uh, there's a report in 2007 of a limit of detection of 90, 90 nanomolar, so closer to what we're trying to get to. And then Eric Kuhn was able to use fractionation, in other words, um, taking the complex proteome that is plasma and sort of split it up into bins and then measure each of the bins individually. He was able to show a limit of detection for C-reactive protein down to 7 nanomoles per liter. Again, we're still a thousand times above what we're looking for, but we're getting closer. So it turns out that when we tried to just digest plasma and look for the peptides that we're interested in, um, by mass spectrometry, the limit of detection was 30,000 nanograms per mil. And that's 30,000 times insensitive, too insensitive for use in our clinical laboratory. So that was unfortunate. But thyroglobulin is not your average protein. It's gigantic. It is a dimer of 330 kilodalton monomers. It's about 10% carbohydrate. It's got all sorts of post-translational modifications. So, uh, iodination and, and other oxidations, uh, sulfation, phosphorylation. Can't we use one of these characteristics to pull thyroglobulin away from the rest of the bulk protein? And so that's what we've done here. I'm going to say that we tried size filters. So they have lots of spin filters that you can buy. We tried seven of them. It turns out that thyroglobulin, if albumin stays above the, the filter, so does thyroglobulin. If albumin goes through the filter, so does thyroglobulin. Surprised me. And every single manufacturer had exactly the same problem. 
So size filtration didn't work, but size exclusion chromatography did. And so what I'm showing here is in the blue tracing, this is the uh, absorbance at 280. So this is the bulk protein that's coming off of the size exclusion column. And then the pink is the amino assay, showing us where thyroglobulin is eluding off of the column. And as you can see, we've really separated the thyroglobulin from the bulk protein um, just using size exclusion chromatography. So we've, we've separated it from a lot of the protein. Maybe this can help. And it did. It helped tenfold. So we got to 3,000 nanograms per mil, exactly 3,000 times too useless. <laughs> So then the question became, could we do something else? Let's think outside the box, let's try something else. And the idea was, what if we use antibodies to pull out our peptide of interest? So we've made our digest, we have the peptides of interest and the sea of a bunch of peptides we really don't care about. Can we use a peptide, an, a, an antibody directed towards our peptides to enrich for the peptides that we're interested in? And if worse came to worse, could we even do size exclusion chromatography and then do that to try to get the sensitivity that we need? So I'm only going to tell you about going this pathway because it actually wasn't necessary to use size exclusion chromatography. So the question is, is it really possible? And it turns out that in the literature there is an example. Uh, this is in mouse serum, but uh, Jeff Whitaker and, and um, Mandy Polovich over at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center published a, an assay for fibulin-2, which turned out to be a, a breast cancer tumor marker in this mouse strain. And they had a limit of detection of 380 picomoles. Now that's much closer to the one to three picomoles that we're trying to get in our assay. So it's quite encouraging. Again, there's precedence in the literature, but no one's ever done it in, in, uh, in humans for a, 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 a clinically used tumor marker. So first we had to pick peptides. We had to take thyroglobulin, and we had to say which peptides from thyroglobulin are actually going to be useful in the mass spec assay. And to do that, we just had to do it empirically. So we took thyroglobulin, a couple of different preparations that were available commercially. We used three different digestion protocols, basically destroying the protein as much as we possibly could before we digested it with trypsin, and then other protocols which didn't destroy it. We used um, de what we call de novo sequencing on two different mass spectrometers. One was a MALDI, which uh, uses a laser off of a solid surface. And we used something else, which is electrospray ionization, which uses the HPLC that I was talking about before. The simple reason being, I, didn't, I don't know what the final platform is going to be in the clinical laboratory <coughs> for mass spectrometry of proteins. So I wanted to make sure that we found a peptide that would ionize really well on, on both of the platforms that we might use. We use this uh, hydrophobicity, the Hopwood scale. It turns out that no one really knows what makes a peptide immunogenic in a rabbit and what doesn't. And this was the best that I could find in the literature. It also turns out that basically any peptide that ionizes well in a mass spectrometer has balanced hydrophobicity, so that was sort of redundant. And technically, for technical reasons, we didn't accept partially digested peptides, which means there were no trypsin cleavage sites in the middle of the peptides that we looked at. And this is a very long list of lots of peptides that we identified. And I didn't, I made it so you couldn't see it because I don't want you to see it. There are basically three peptides that we picked out of this long list um, to use to immunize our rabbits. And the best peptide, uh, which is listed at the very top, was um, it ionized extremely well. It digested well under any conditions. It is the best peptide that we could find to, uh, to quantify thyroglobulin. So we made that into an internal standard peptide. So we made it an internal standard peptide by incorporating deuterium into one of the valines uh, in the peptide. So again, it will come off the HPLC column at exactly the same time, but have a different mass. So given this internal standard peptide, we could now ask the question, how much thyroglobulin is actually in the international reference material? So when they made the international reference material back in 1994, they just used a Lowry, a, a, or a, a regular protein assay which is nonspecific. So now we can actually say, I know, that we're looking specifically at thyroglobulin, how much is there? So the way that we did that was make a linear dilution of, the thi of this reference material. We digested it with trypsin. We spiked in a certain amount of internal standard into every single one of those dilutions. And we asked, where is the reference material peptide divided by the internal standard peptide, I'm talking about peak areas here, equal to one? And it turns out that this isn't a linear relationship. It's actually a power function for reasons that I can't explain. Um, but if you plot it on a log-log curve, it's actually a straight line. 
And so what we're asking for is where is the response exactly equals to one, and we can draw a line, find out and interpolate, we can interpolate exactly the full dilution of the reference material that we would need to get a response of one, and we found that there's exactly 317 nanograms per mil plus or minus seven. Um, they found by uh, Bradford, or sorry, by Lowry, 324, so we're pretty close. Um, so we're confident that we're doing a good job, and we're confident that the reference material is what they say it is. So just to summarize this part, we hope to use mass spectrometry to solve many of the problems that we have with amino assays. We didn't get much of a bonus by trying to separate it um, using size uh, filtration or size exclusion. We now have three peptides that we can inject into bunny rabbits to make anti-peptide antibodies. We synthesized one as an internal standard, and using that, we were able to show good agreement with the established value from the, in the reference material. So let's try to make some antithyroglobulin peptide antibodies. To do that, we took the peptides that we had synthesized and stuck them to keyhole limpet hemocyanin, or KLH. And then we injected the, the peptides conjugated to KLH into rabbits, and the rabbits decided to make a nice immune response to two of those three peptides. And then we used a solid phase to purify the antibodies. I'm not going to go into great detail about that solid phase purification because I'm going to go into detail about how it really messed us up at the very end of the talk. And then we use these purified antibodies to pull out the peptides from our digests. And the assay looks something like this. We have our human plasma sample, complete with thyroglobulin and autoantibodies. We digest the heck out of it with trypsin into little itty bitty peptides. And we add an internal standard peptide. When we incubate this with beads, we're now using paramagnetic beads coated with this anti-peptide antibody mixture. And we're going to pull out the thyroglobulin peptides from the sample, as well as the internal standard peptide. And then we're going to quantify after we elute by LCMSMS. I'm not going to walk through every step. I'm just going to put up this slide to say it takes us three days. So that's not a fast assay. <laughs> Dr. Fine, since he's left the room, he might, uh, doesn't have to hear about how bad the turnaround time is going to be. <clears throat> uh, the liquid chromatography mass spectrometry um, it's pretty straightforward, but again, I'm just mentioning this is 33 minutes per sample right now, <clears throat> the way the assay is set up, so a long time. We use a, an applied biosystems Q-trap. I'm not ad, uh, advocating any particular um, platform, especially given some of the data that comes from other platforms. It's very comparable. Um, but we're using Nanoflow. So most of our LCMS assays that are, the LCMS assays that are in our clinical lab right now are running at um, 400 microliters a minute. We're running at one microliter a minute. So you can barely even see the spray or can barely even see the flow of this um, liquid chromatography system. Uh, and the, the rest is pretty technical, but I do want to point out that we're using the internal standard peptide because it helps us control for the peak area variation I talked about during the day, but also it helps us control for exactly the amount of beads that we're adding to the sample. So the internal standard peptide helps us, or should help us. This is what the chromatography looks like. This is our internal standard peptide, and this is peptide number one. These are the peptides that are exactly the same as far as the HPLC is concerned, but you can see that, um, for instance, this transition, this is a fragment ion, um, are, are different in mass by six Daltons. Now, the, um, what I have on the right, and part of the reason that the Q-trap is an interesting um, instrument, is the ability to make an MSMS spectrum. So I can look and identify every one of these ions. So in theory, if I had a peak show up, I could do this MSMS spectrum and say, aha, that's exactly the peptide that I think I'm looking for. But it turns out that I can't get a reliable spectrum less than 100 nanograms per mil. So when we're trying to get a sensitivity of one nanogram per mil, um, this isn't really that helpful. This is peptide number two. You'll see that we've separated it from some, another peak that has exactly the same precursor mass to charge ratio and the same fragment mass to charge ratio. So without HPLC, it would be difficult to tease these two um, molecules apart. And then peptide three didn't really make a very good antibody response in the rabbit, and it's not really that great of a peptide. Um, by HPLCMS, and so we never really looked at it again. So we could, we could ask the question, does the internal standard actually help? And so when you look um, uh, on the left-hand side, the peak area is on the y-axis, the concentration of thyroglobin is on the x-axis, and things are pretty linear when you get to concentrated when you get to um, concentrations of thyroglobulin that are above what we're really looking for. 
But um, and there's a lot of variability along the baseline. When we added the internal standard peptide, and now we have response on the y-axis, we actually got, got good linearity with peptide 2. And it turns out that the limit of detection for peptide 1 in the system was about 30 nanograms per mil, so threefold higher than what we were shooting for. And the limit of detection for peptide 2, as I'll show you in a couple of slides, is around 3 nanograms per mil, so not quite there. But what I wanted to point on the left is that the response is not zero. So we had absolutely no thyroglobulin in the sample, yet there's still plenty of signal coming in from the mass spectrometer. And I'm going to talk later about where that peptide came from. But it's really the problem of why we haven't been able to introduce this clinically yet. So we had serum, uh, human serum calibrators. I just wanted to give you an example of a calibration curve that we're working from. So again, we're relying on the response and converting that into a TG concentration. The, uh, the reason I'm showing this is just to look at the imprecision of the assay. So it's 15 to 25 percent, which isn't perfect. But as I showed you, there's gazillions of steps. So potentially by automating the steps, uh, maybe by shortening some of the steps, we could get this down to an assay that's more reasonable. But I'm pointing out that we're measuring now with a limit of detection uh, at picomolar concentrations of proteins by mass spectrometry in a, in a real clinical sample. And so we're at 2.6 nanograms per mil. Uh, is as sensitive as we've been able to get so far. Again, I mock the amino assay. We use it all the time, so obviously I love them, but it's more fun to, for, for, to make it the enemy. So um, the comparison with the Beckman amino assay that we use in our laboratory was actually pretty reasonable. So an R squared of 0.81 is an R of about 0.9, so that's pretty good. Um, the slope is around 1, as would be expected. So um, this, again, looks a lot better than I thought it would, considering the concentrations that we're working at. I did have uh, the opportunity to work with uh, another reference laboratory who had, who had heard of our assay, and they uh, called and said, hey, we have this weird sample. The outside laboratory says that they got 15 nanograms per mil, but it was inconsistent with the clinical picture, so they sent it to us and it was negative by our assay. Would you mind checking it? You can be the tiebreaker. We said, sure, why not? Uh, so the question is, could the new method help? And so when we ran uh, the assay that day, actually Jess Becker from my laboratory ran the assay. She ran calibrators and R2 controls. Uh, and you can see that the unknown patient really doesn't have detectable concentrations of thyroglobulin. So we were able to go back to the outside reference laboratory and say, no, you were right. The outside laboratory was wrong. Now I want to talk more about the background peptide because what's really holding us back is this background that we have. And you can't just, you, you don't get something from nothing. So this peptide had to come from someplace. And so we've done a lot of investigation. We're not the first people to uh, find this, but it has big ramifications for many of the um, cell biology and other experiments that people do uh, using commercially available antibodies. Here's a busy slide, but I'm listing every step so that we can think about what's going on. So first we have to make a solid phase. This is the affinity solid phase. So we conjugate a peptide to albumin. And but it turns out that the peptides non-covalently hang out with albumin in the assay in, in this, uh, during this conjugation process. So when you take your conjugate, you actually have peptides carried along with it, and you attach it to your sephiros. Now this is what we're going to use to pull the antipeptide antibodies out of rabbit serum. So you have a sephiros bead, you have albumin, and you have the peptide. This is the way it's supposed to look. But unfortunately, some peptides bound to the surface of the sephiros bead um, because it was carried along with the albumin. Now, when you incubate your serum with the beads, the peptides slowly hydrolyze off of the sephiros beads and end up sitting in the binding site of your antibody. Now, in our the uh, uh, anti serum that uh, or the uh, antibody preparations that Jess have been that Jess has been making, there is one peptide for every forty thousand antibody molecules. Now, you're not going to be able to tell that by most of your experiments. Obviously, we have the sensitivity to detect it. And the question was, does this happen all the time? And the answer is yes. If you make a sephiros bead, and it doesn't matter how you attach your peptide to the bead, you're always going to have a slow release of that peptide, and your, the commercially uh, purified antibodies that you buy off of the shelf has peptides sitting in the binding site. And it really varies from 1 in 40,000 to the highest that I've seen from a different laboratory that let us analyze their antibodies was about 1 in 4,000. So this problem has caused us to not be able to use this clinically for a long time. So Jess has been working hard to try to figure out if there's a different way uh, to purify the antibodies. So what she did was use mutated peptide. Uh, 
And so she uh, changed one of the aspartic acids to glutamic acid and used that as the solid phase to purify the antibodies. Because it's negatively charged, the antibody couldn't tell the difference, and we were able to get antibodies that had absolutely no background at all. So Jess is now trying to figure out if this assay can be sensitive enough for clinical use. So to summarize, we have a new thyroglobulin mass spectrometric assay. The limit of detection is about 2.6. I always round up to 3. It's about threefold off. It has a good correlation with immunoassay, but the best part is that we're destroying those anti-reagent antibodies, and we're destroying those autoantibodies by trypsin, so they can't interfere with our assay anymore. There's a program from the National Cancer Institute called the CPTAC, uh, making monoclonal antibodies to our peptides for us, which I think is great. Um, we're also trying some more sensitive mass spectrometers, and hopefully one day we'll use a prospective clinical trial to show that a mass spectrometric thyroglobulin assay does something good for patients, but that's to come. So the question at the end of my title is, is there hope? And this is the... Uh, this is the Hood Canal, which supplies about 30% of the oysters. I don't know if you ever had oysters before, but my, uh, just eating them off of the shore is a life-changing experience for me. But uh, the word hope is on the other shore. It's close, but it's not right here. So I think we're making some great progress. I have to thank Jess Becker, who's an extremely talented technologist and now graduate student. She really did all of the um, thyroglobulin work. Any of, anything that I didn't do, she has done, and, and it's just an incredible opportunity to work with her. Uh, Luke Marney, uh, again, who's now in the Department of Chemistry, and Sean Auger have really taken this project from nothing to something, and I appreciate all of their help. Mike McCoss, Jeff Whitaker, and Matt Champion have all helped get the uh, initial mass spec assay um, up and running uh, with consultation with them. So I appreciate all of their consultative advice. Jay Heineke from the Department of Medicine is an important collaborator and was, is also a mentor. But most importantly, Mark Wenner, who's been a, an incredible mentor, and I really appreciate all of your help. That, uh, that you've done for me over the last few years. And with that, I'll be done and take any questions you guys might have. So while you guys are, for, are formulating uh, questions, I have one for you. So you, you mentioned that uh, when you uh, use this assay to, um, to look at the, at the international standard, mm -hmm. um, it, it, it wasn't linear. I mean, does that mean that the assay is not linear? I have absolutely no idea why it's not linear. And it could be um, mass spectrometer related, but I think that it's actually um, trypsin related. And I, I really don't know why. We haven't done the experiments to try to figure out exactly why it's not linear. But it could be a combination of both. But is it just the standard that's not lit? Linear? Uh, it's the digestion uh, of the standard and then measuring the signal by mass spectrometry. So the internal standard should correct for any nonlinearity, but it turns out that it doesn't. And the question is why, and I don't know what it is. It could be the mass spec or it could be the digestion itself. But that's not true for other, for, for other analytes? Is no, it's not true. for So anything that doesn't have trips in digestion is by its very nature, is linear for three or four orders of magnitude. And so all of our small molecule analytes are, are linear for, you know, two to three orders of magnitude. So it, that's why I think it has something to do with digesting a protein. We don't know for sure. So your um, assay is designed uh, against synthetic peptides that are not post-translationally modified, correct? But That's right. So there's, there's no evidence in the literature that those peptides have any post-translational modifications or um, uh, polymorphisms or anything else. In vivo. in vivo. And so do we know that in someone who has cancer that they're not no. modified? Absolutely not. No, that's, that's the real, the real problem is, so I've been mocking amino assays, you know, for years now, but the real, the simple fact is when we get all of these assays online, we're going to find out there's all sorts of new problems that we didn't know about. Um, what you're suggesting, though, is that there could be post-translational modifications that we don't know about. The argument is, why don't we measure as many peptides from that protein that we possibly can? And if we can detect any one of them that's specific enough to say that there is some thyroglobulin there, which clinically is very important. Um, but, I mean, if every peptide is ruined, then not even your immunoassay is going to be positive. You're not even going to be able to call it a thyroglobulin. So the idea is measure as many peptides as you can. If you have a polymorphism that removes one from the mix, you at least have others that you can fall back on. If there's a post-translational modification, the same kind of logic applies. Any other questions? Paul? All right. Thank, Thank you. you.